Well, hello, my friends, and welcome back to this, our second lecture for the seventh week of HS211, History of the Restoration Movement Online. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at a interesting study of Christian pacifism. Now, we've had to whittle this down to actually call it Christian as opposed to just pacifism, because Christian pacifism is its own thing, that it has its own reasoning and its own ideas behind it, and often those ideas are very different from pacifistic ideas that we'll find outside of the Christian religion. And in particular, since this is our conjuncture lecture, we're going to be starting with the idea of where did Christians get the idea to be a pacifist? And specifically, we're then going to trace that development until we get to the time of the American Restoration Movement. And we're going to ask, how did some of these people respond to the idea of pacifism, both pro and con, as the country they lived in, America, began to divide under issues such as race and slavery, and the question of whether to fight for one's country or not became a paramount question during the years leading up to the Civil War. So, if you're ready, let's hit the trail. So, in our previous lectures, one of the ideas that have come up over and over again is that the Restoration Movement is based on trying to balance two distinct and often opposing pleas. The first plea being, can't we explore and pursue Christian unity among various different Christian groups and sects, trying to get them to work together and to cooperate and eventually experience union? And at the same time, can't we have a reliance on the Bible? Can't we have this document become our constitution to show us what it means to be a Christian and to throw off the chains and the shackles of hundreds, if not thousands of years of Christian thinking and development that have produced many non-Christian or at least non-biblical ideas. And one of the issues that's going to come up, especially during the Civil War, is we simply have to wrestle with the reality that we have people on both sides of this war that will be allied with the restoration movement. And nothing is going to jeopardize that plea for Christian unity more than to have two people both claiming to worship the same God, following the same scriptures, pointing guns at one another and saying, die. And so let that sink in for a second. How does a movement stand for both unity of Christians, and not just Christians within its own movement, but unity for Christians across denominational lines. How do you stand up for something like that, while at the same time brandishing a weapon? And the answer to this that many of the people in the Restoration Movement are going to conclude is that a Christian should be a pacifist, at least in regards to, they should be a pacifist in regards to other people claiming to be Christian. And what we're going to find, and this is one of those things that just often shocks and surprises people who read the documents of the early Restoration Movement, is how frequently the idea of pacifism comes up, and how passionately the idea is defended on both biblical and philosophical grounds. And so it's one of those things that even if you yourself today are not a pacifist, doing a study of the Restoration Movement forces you to wrestle with the idea that many of these people were. And so as, as a historical study, we have to be willing to ask the question, why did they get this way? What was it in this idea of pacifism that was driving them towards their conclusions? And we're going to need to ask this question specifically this way because, if I could be honest, most people within the Restoration Movement today are not pacifists. And so because it's a rather rare trait today, it may kind of seem like it's from left field or that it doesn't make a lot of sense because even in our own culture, now only 150 years divorced from their culture, it just seems rather odd, it just seems to be a rather odd position to take. 
And so before we go diving into this whole thing, we're going to need to basically say up front that this is another one of those hot button issues. I've had this conversation and taught this class many times, and if there's one thing I can say, this is one of those lectures that tends to divide people, that people who are pacifistic or that strongly lead towards pacifism tend to get very frustrated at the rhetoric of people who are pro-involvement in war, and likewise, people who are pro-involvement in war find the ideas of Christian pacifists just to be bizarre, if not downright contrary to good common sense. And so I'll just begin by stating up front, this can be a very controversial topic. Now, we're going to try to keep a lot of the discussions in our discussion forums fairly civil about this, but as always, I need to point you back to the syllabus. When we get to the discussion, we're going to need to be very civil about it. And so, as per the rules of the class, you will need to respect one another. You will need to seek understanding from an opposing viewpoint before responding, basically asking that you let others speak, listen and consider before simply saying you're wrong. And if you do feel strongly that you need to debate an idea, I am going to encourage you to use biblical evidence. We are at a Christian college, and a idea just from your own mind is not going to carry the same weight as an idea being bolstered by biblical evidence. So please use biblical evidence as you discuss these ideas. And above all, respond with a Christ-like attitude, even when you disagree. The point here is not to win an argument. The point here is not necessarily to prove you are right. The point here is that we are learning why they thought what they were thinking and trying to make sense of it in a cultural context to explain historically why something was true. And so, as we discuss this, you will need to speak the truth to your fellow students in love. I've found that no one really ever convinces another person to agree with you if you are yelling at them, if you are calling them stupid, if you are using various other types of arguing that would follow into the ad hominem category or the personal attacks category. So keep all of this in mind as we discuss this fairly controversial issue. So, because we're discussing this from a biblical standpoint, we should probably begin by saying, well, what does the Bible have to say about the issue of pacifism? And if I may be so bold, that if you begin with the Old Testament, you don't need to look long or hard to find examples of people who solve their problems with military and with violent aggression. Just for an example, let's look at David here from our picture. David is a young man. He is finding that his army of Israelites is being challenged by a giant by the name of Goliath, even though David is not himself in the army yet. He is going to volunteer to go fight Goliath, and using a slingshot and a stone and the giant's own sword, he will kill him and cut off his head. And David will earn large amounts of praise for this, both from his fellow countrymen, and that he will seem to be pleasing God with many of these acts. In fact, David will attribute his success not because of his own martial strength or his own superior mind, but because God is with him. And so, this will bring up a very interesting paradigm in the Old Testament, at least a paradigm that exists before the Jewish exile, is that most of the people that God will select to lead Israel, part of those leadership duties involves leading an army. And frequently, the judgment of whether or not a person is a good leader and specifically a holy person who is following God and his designs, will be whether or not they win their battles. If they do win their battles, frequently the assessment of the scriptures will be that God is with them. Likewise, if they lose their battles, there will, there will often be the assessment that God is judging such a leader, and that there is some kind of sin that is responsible for the reason that they are not winning.
And so we have a very clear distinction all the way up through to the Jew Jewish exile that if a person is a good leader, they are following God, that they will have victory in battle. And so if you are trying to build a biblical argument, we have to acknowledge from the beginning that you are hard pressed to find an Old Testament example of a pacifist, or at least one who acts so consistently. Now, you may have noted from the previous slide that I kept saying over and over again, up until the exilic period. Once we get to the exilic period of the Old Testament, we start to see a shift. Israel's last king will be um, taken to Babylon as a prisoner in 586 BC. And from this point on, Israel will cease to have a military ruler. And because of that, we just don't see Israel's heroes of the faith after the exile fighting large scale battles. Now, to compound this problem, we see in Jeremiah chapter 29 that he is going to write a letter to those exiles that are living in Babylon, and he's going to command them something weird. He is going to tell them that he wants them to settle down, to live peacefully, to not cause a ruckus in this new land where they've been conquered and exiled to, and to basically become good citizens of that new kingdom they're living in. And so it is interesting to me that from this point onward, we do not find a hero in the Bible. We do not find a prophet saying things in the name of the Lord where there is a active call to rebellion and specifically to say, follow this leader, follow his banner, take up a sword in his name and in God's name and go push these people out. And so all through the exilic period, we're going to have first the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, finally the Romans, and all of the canonical scriptural documents are going to point in one direction, that while a person may have the ability to physically attack another person for sin, for example, uh, Nehemiah will strike a person for taking a unlawful wife according to the law of Moses. We just aren't going to see someone becoming a military leader in the name of God from the point of the exile onward. Now, I also had to hedge a bet here that we had to specifically say that this applies to the scriptures. There are the books of the Old Testament Apocrypha, especially books like First and Second Maccabees, which basically will claim that God picked a new priestly family to rise up and attack the Greeks and to establish a new kingdom, a kingdom known as the Hasmonean dynasty. And this kingdom would exist from approximately 164 BC all the way until 63 BC. So it had a good 100 year run. The only problem is Christians have largely judged these books to not be scriptural. And so it brings up an interesting point. Is part of what didn't make them scriptural, the fact that they were going against Jeremiah's primary directive to the exiles, that while this exile is happening, while you are being ruled by these other kingdoms, you are to be good citizens that don't rise up in rebellion. It's an interesting question, but... I think just looking at the Old Testament data, we do see a shift after the exilic period. We do not see another leader rise up to kick out the ruling pagan nation and to replace it with a theocracy like we had before the exile. Now, as you're probably aware through this class, many people within the restoration movement, and particularly Alexander Campbell, had this basic idea that yeah, well, the Old Testament is nice. If we're coming up with, well, what is a Christian to do? We basically can say the Old Testament has no bearing on us to this day. And so while I had to look at the Old Testament points of view simply because they make up a large chunk of the current theology today on whether or not a nation could go to war or what does it mean to be a leader in an army and also a believer, 
Simply put, when we get to the early years of the Restoration Movement, there is such a strong movement to say, well, what does the New Testament and the New Testament alone have to say, that any of the things that could be mustered from the Old Testament will simply just be said, that's Old Testament, doesn't qualify for this argument. So, for here, we're going to look at, well, what does the New Testament have to say about this idea of pacifism? And let me begin by saying, it's complicated. For example, you could, reading the New Testament, build both a pro-warfare and a anti-warfare argument. And so, I'll begin by looking at some of the pro-warfare arguments. So, firstly, let me also note this. The New Testament never denigrates the off office or occupation of soldier. Simply put, no one in the New Testament is saying soldiers are bad simply because they are soldiers. Now, we will find in places like Luke 3.14 that people like John the Baptist will say, now if you're a soldier, you need to use your power responsibly. You can't use it to oppress people or to steal from them or to get more money. And <clears throat> there is no outright rejection, basically to say, oh, well, this person is a soldier, therefore they can't be a believer. We just simply don't see in the New Testament a denigration of the occupation. Now, to this, we can also add that there are numerous stories of soldiers coming to know both Christ when he is doing his ministry and soldiers becoming Christians after Christ has sends into heaven. For example, during uh, Ephesians chapter 6, Paul will use the idea of the soldier and his armor as a very positive metaphor for what does it mean to live a Christian life. More to the point, Scripture texts like Acts chapter 10, Acts 16, explicitly tell of people like Cornelius and the Philipp Philippian jailer, who, once they are presented with the gospel, become believers, they become baptized, and that from this point on, they are discussed as Christians. And then finally, during Jesus' ministry, we see numerous people, usually of the centurion rank, approaching Jesus, and Jesus will frequently commend them for their faith. And so, the New Testament makes it very clear that a person who is a soldier can and should become a Christian. And then finally, the last uh, stone in the pro-warfare pro argument wall is simply that while Jesus does not perform acts of violence often, he does perform acts of violence. For example, in John 2.15 and in Matthew 12.21 and similar stories in Mark and Luke, we see Jesus in the temple. He finds the money changers that are doing un improper things. He will flip tables. According to John, he will even uh, build a whip out of cords and he will start driving these people out of the market. He will do a violent but non-lethal action. And so, all of these ideas are where we would get the understanding that the New Testament is not explicitly anti-war, or at least anti-soldier, or even anti-violence. But before we get too carried away here, we also have to look at the anti-war arguments. And the biggest thing that most people begin by pointing out is, Jesus defeats sin and death on the cross and not by a military victory. And of course, this is one of the surprising things that many of the Jewish people of the first century are surprised when they hear that the Messiah, instead of leading a glorious revolution against the Roman Empire, is killed on a Roman cross, the lowest and possibly the most base form of execution a Jew could experience at the hands of a Gentile nation. And here's where it becomes controversial from a first century standpoint. Paul will say in places like Colossians 2.15 that Jesus accomplishes this defeat, that things that military personnel could not accomplish by the sword, Jesus accomplishes by suffering and dying on the cross. Simply put, the cross does something that war and military or violent means could not. And to build on this, we notice that especially after the ascension of Jesus, we don't see Christians described as defending themselves with physical force. 
the few martyrdoms that are described, for example, the martyrdom of Stephen, have him taking no physical action to save himself, i.e. running away, nor taking a physical action to um, fight back when people are trying to unlawfully execute him. And so we will see this time and time again, that while there will be the occasional escape, for example, Acts chapter 12, Peter will be led by an angel out of a Roman jail. For the most part, when someone is persecuted by a pagan or Jewish person, they suffer in the New Testament. And this does seem to go hand in hand with many of Jesus' personal teachings on violence. For example, Matthew 5.39, Matthew 26.52, and passages like that give this idea that, you know, if an evil person strikes you, let them strike you a second time. If someone tries to take away your coat, give them your clothes as well. You know, and Jesus gets to that point where even when he's being taken prisoner, his right-hand man, Peter, draws a sword, cuts off somebody's ear, and what does Jesus do? First, he undoes the damage and puts the ear back, and then he tells Peter, put that sword away. If you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. And so, we certainly have many statements of Jesus that seem to point in the direction that Christians are not to respond to violence with more violence. And Possibly the most interesting issue here in the anti-warfare argument is that we don't see the stories of these converted soldiers, or any government officials for that matter, after their initial conversion. Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, the governor of the, um, the island of Cyprus in uh, Acts uh, 13 and 14, uh, the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, while they have very profound conversion stories, the moment Paul leaves, we never hear their names again. We never know if they stood and continued to be soldiers. We never know if they faced problems between things like the Roman laws that said that every good soldier has to offer a sacrifice to the god of war before you go into battle. Would a Christian soldier have done that? Probably not. But it does bring up an interesting problem. We don't see anything in the scriptures after the conversion of a soldier to explain, well, now here's what you do now that you are a soldier. Here's how you juggle the commands of Jesus with the, you know, with your occupation. And so the New Testament data paints a very complicated picture of both possibly pro-war, or at least pro-redemptive violence, and anti-warfare rhetoric. Now, to this, we need to add possibly a third set of data. And while I'm including this under the anti-warfare argument, this is specifically dealing with the problem of Christian versus Christian violence. The first of these issues we see is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. Here, Paul is going to tell the Christians who are fighting, and specifically in Corinth, that they are taking one another to trial. He is going to say, you know, it is wrong for you to publicly make a spectacle of Christianity by you being a Christian, your opponent being a Christian, and for you to go to a pagan judge and air your dirty laundry out for all the pagan world to see. Paul actually says, you know, here's what would be better. If you've got this argument, take the smallest, most insignificant child among you and let that person be your judge rather than taking it to a place where the pagans can see it. So simply put, Paul basically says, if you're going to be a Christian, don't do something publicly against another Christian that will cause people that are pagans to look at Christianity and go, well, <laughs> if that's what Christian is, I don't want anything to do with it. And the argument goes as follows. If Paul would say, look, don't even do something publicly like take another Christian to court, how much worse would it be if it became known, oh, this Christian murdered another Christian. This Christian, you know, stole, you know, someone's uh, carriage or wife or whatever, and the response was someone then went and murdered them or avenged themselves. And so we have the very real issue here that 
Paul's teaching basically says that if you have two Christians, we shouldn't have fighting amongst them. And to this, John in uh, the first epistle of John will go so far as to say, look, there are many people in this church here who are claiming that they love God, and I can prove that they don't. And here's how he proves it. He says, you cannot love a God who you have not seen if you also hate your Christian brothers or sisters whom you have seen. He basically argues, look, it is impossible to love the God who made these human beings if you don't love his creation. And so, and he specifically uses this to address the problem of Christians fighting other Christians. You can't, and basically saying, if you want to know who the real Christians are, they're the ones who love each other. And so all of this paints a picture that Christians, especially when we are looking at warfare, fighting, whatever, in a violent way among other Christians, we, have a, we do have a much more clear New Testament statement that there should not be fighting amongst Christian groups. So this leaves us with a very interesting dilemma. What do we make of all of this data? Some that could be talked about in pro warfare ways and some that could be talked about in anti-warfare ways. Well, I know we've often been looking at the early church as kind of ways of, you know, judging trajectories. And so we're going to do that here. We're going to look at a few early church people and basically ask, how did they read these scriptures? How did they see it? And the simple answer is going to be that in the first two centuries after the apostolic age, we are almost going to find universal pacifism that based on Jesus's teachings and the other teachings we find in the New Testament, most Christians are going to assume several things. And those things are going to be one, a Christian probably can't juggle being a soldier and being a Christian. They're going to conclude that if a person is a soldier, they should probably quit if they're going to become a Christian. And they will also judge that if they are ever drafted or forced to work in the army, that they should basically do everything they can to get out of that arrangement. <clears throat> and here's a couple of those examples. First is from a man by the name Justin Martyr, who's writing probably around 140 or 150 AD. He says this in his first apology, quote, we who formerly murdered one another not only do not war against our enemies, but in order not to lie or deceive our judges, we gladly die confessing Christ. And in his dialogue that he writes a little bit later in his life, he says this, We who were full of war and murder of one another and all wickedness have changed our warlike instruments, plows, swords into plows, and spears into agricultural implements. Of course, he's quoting that famous passage from Isaiah, that Isaiah 11, that God will, when he does his thing, that he will take uh, the swords and beat them into plowshares and the spears into pruning hooks. But notice what he's basically saying there. Justin Martyr is assuming that the pre-Christian lifestyle is one that is full of things like murder and warfare, and that the after Christian lifestyle, the post-conversion lifestyle, is one that denounces these things. Again, it's not necessarily explicit. We've never went to war, but it is definitely saying that you know, based on things Jesus has taught, we would say that the proof of a Christian conversion is one that resists these things like murder and warfare. Now, by about 200 AD, we're going to find a Roman who is going to be looking at Christianity very closely, and he's not going to like what he sees, and so he's going to write a anti-Christian tract. Now, this Roman orator is by the, goes by the name of Celsus, and Celsus is going to have as one of his many problems with Christianity. He notes that every Christian he's met is a pacifist. And Celsus will basically argue, you know, if we all did what you Christians want and convert to your religion, there wouldn't be anyone to fight in the army. The barbarians would come in, Rome would be destroyed, and everything would be lost, is his basic argument. 
And to this, a Christian living in Alexandria by the name of Origen is going to write a defense, and he's going to spend several pages describing the pacifism problem. And what I find interesting is that Origen doesn't deny that he believes most, if not all, Christians are pacifists. He says this in his reply, quote, We also by our prayers destroy all demons, the ones who cause wars, violate oaths, and disturb the peace. And we are more help to those who rule than those who seem to be fighting battles. We fight better on behalf of the king. Indeed, we do not fight by his side, even if he should command it. But we fight on his behalf, organizing our own army of piety through our prayers to God. If I could unpack that, Origen basically says, we don't fight wars, we pray. And in doing so, we attack the problem of warfare at its source. That the problem of warfare is demonic activity, and we as Christians are in that business of fighting demonic activity. And so he basically says, look, King, if you want us to be helpful in your situation, don't ask us to pick up a sword. Ask us to stay where we already are, on our knees, praying. And so Origen will go on even further later in this document, and he'll basically said, and to Celsius, who says, you know, if everyone in the Roman Empire did this, you know, the barbarians would come in and they would conquer us. Origen actually says the opposite. He says, if everyone in the empire did what we do, they would be, you know, destroying the source of war because we're praying to destroy these demons and these people who would war to begin with. And because of this, he basically says, instead of having constant warfare or even the destruction of Rome, you would have peace like you've never seen it before simply because that's how powerful Christian prayer is. Now, on a personal note, I find this to be a very, very charming idea. In many ways in our culture today, when the question of war comes up, often the first question is, you know, how are we going to defend ourselves against very evil people? And while Christians frequently will pray for this, I often wonder how much they think it helps simply because it's never the first thing they think of. And it certainly isn't like origin that it's the only thing they think of that will work. And so origin offers a very interesting rhetoric in the pacifism ar arsenal. He basically says, it's not that we're not fighting, it's that we understand that the root cause of violence is a spiritual problem. And you don't fight a spiritual problem with violence. You fight a spiritual problem with prayer. Now, to conclude this first section here, let me give the floor to a Restoration Movement scholar by the name of Everett Ferguson. Now, I should probably just say from the get-go, Everett Ferguson comes from the Non-Instrumental Churches of Christ, and this is really the only branch of the Restoration Movement today that is strongly still advocating the ideas of pacifism. And so I will admit, Ferguson does have somewhat of an axe to grind that pacifism is a ideal of the non-instrumental churches of Christ. But he will say this in response to all of these things we saw with Origen. Quote, the weightiest theological case for Christian non-involvement in military service came from Origen. Apparently, Celsus did not know of any Christians in the army, and he understood that their rejection of military service to be a matter of principle with them. Thus, it is notable that Origen does not answer Celsus by saying, No, you're wrong. Look, here are Christians who do fight for the empire. Rather, Origen accepts the accuracy of what Celsus is saying and seeks to justify the Christian abs abstentation from military service. For Origen, the Christian position is a consistent pacifism. And so, this is where I will conclude, is that while the New Testament teachings by themselves are somewhat, you know, nebulous, you could make a pro-war, you could make a pacifism argument from scriptures using just the New Testament alone. And here's one of those places where the witness of the early church may help with a hermeneutical key. Simply put, people reading the New Testament 
closest to ground zero of when these documents first dropped, understood them to be a plea for pacifism. And they acted accordingly all the way up until the time of Constantine, the first Christian emperor. Now, like so many other things we've looked at in this course so far, Constantine really will change the game for this idea of Christian pacifism. We simply have a Christian leader now that the emperor is claiming to be a Christian, and this emperor needs an army. So what do I do if I am a Christian and I hear that my Christian emperor needs an army? Well, to be honest, I start to look for reasons why I should be answering his call. And I start to do my hermeneutics of the scripture in such a way that I justify Christian involvement in the military. And so I find it interesting that the probably the best and most impassioned plea for Christians to be fighters in the army comes from Augustine, a theologian living after Constantine. And he is specifically wrestling with the idea of, well, what is it that a Christian can and can't do? And this is where we are going to start to see the advent of what we would call just war theory. That Augustine is going to say, well, Christians cannot fight in an offensive war, a war to do things like to gain land or to gain power, but they can fight a defensive war where someone else is attacking and we need to defend our home. And this is going to become pretty much the standard Christian response throughout all of history after Augustine, that we become very used to the idea of Christians fighting in the army, and we hope and pray that the leaders will only fight under a good, just war idea. Now, what's going to happen, though, is once the Roman Empire dissolves, we are going to have many Christian nations springing up, both from barbarian tribesmen and from places that were formerly civilized by the Roman Empire. And these different nations will all boast their own kings. They will all boast their own warriors. And they will all boast that they are Christian. And so from this point on, from the late 400s onward, we're going to start seeing the very real problem of Christians in battles fighting against other people claiming to be Christian. And so we have the ultimate in disregard for things like Paul and things that John was saying that, you know, what is the mark of a Christian? That they love one another. Well, what do we do now that my army is fighting your army and we are both claiming to be Christian? Now, this is going to reach its high water mark during the first century and a half of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther is going to get some very interesting things going in Germany, and it's going to spread all the way to Switzerland, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and France, and other places like Great Britain. And the response to the Protestant Reformation is going to be violently escalated wars against the Roman Catholics. And so pretty much from the mid 1500s all the way till about the dawn of the 1700s, we're going to have just war after war after war fighting against Protestants and Catholics. Both of these groups are going to be certain God is on their side. And they are going to basically say, and how do we prove God is on our side? We win. If we win and you lose, God is obviously for us. Now, of course, the converse is any of these sides that lose will just simply say, well, you know, ever since the Jewish exile, God's people have always been a suffering people. So why should we be any different? But this is going to, I think, probably explain best why the question of Christian pacifism will be so pressing for the people in the Restoration Movement. Because the, ver the threat of war, and specifically threat of war over Christian doctrine, will be very real. They're not thinking of this in the abstract. Is it okay for a Christian to go to war against one another? They're literally living in a time period when you can look to places in the world and say, See? Here's Christians killing each other. This is a problem. So, when we get to the actual 
question of, well, what did various restoration movement pioneers think about this? Probably the place we need to start is Alexander Campbell's Address on War, which was given in Wheeling, West Virginia in 1841. And while it's a fairly long document, and I'm going to have you read this as part of our class materials, I want to just give you this sample because I think it gives a pretty interesting view of basically where Campbell fit on the pacifism spectrum. Quote, But to the common mind, as it seems to me, the most convincing argument against a Christian becoming a soldier may be drawn from the fact that he fights against an innocent person. And I say innocent person so far as the cause of the war is contemplated. Men that fight are not the men that make the war. Politicians, merchants, knaves, and princes cause or make the war. They declare the war, and then they hire men to kill for them. Those that may be hired on the other side are hired to thwart their schemes of personal and family aggrandizement." Unquote. If I could summarize that, Alexander Campbell says, the biggest problem with war is that we have people who are having their differences but they also have the money to dangle a carrot in front of people who have no vested interest in this other than that they live in the country of this ruler and that they will fight for this ruler. Or if I uh, could quote the, uh, the metal song from System of a Down where they ask the question, why don't, why, do pres why don't presidents fight the war? Why do they always send the poor? Campbell makes a very similar argument. He basically says, the biggest issue that I have with war is that the people who are wanting to fight are not the fighters. That, you know, it would be bad enough if, you know, France and Great Britain had a problem and the king of France and Great Britain met on a dusty hillside one afternoon, drew swords and tried to kill one another. That would be bad enough. But the very fact that they use money, they use their power, they use things like conscription and force to basically say, all of you thousands of people in my nation pick up arms for me. He says, this is kind of the highlight of just insanity. Now, up until the 1860s, what we're going to find is that most Americans that are in the restoration movement are really only going to discuss the idea of war from a really kind of abstract or theoretical as aspect. They're really not having to deal with the fact that, hey, at any moment we could be dodging bullets. However, once the Civil War gets started, we're going to start to see that the question of pacifism is going to kind of take the driver's seat simply because once the war is real, it's in their face and it's in their backyard. All of a sudden, we now have to make a very serious distinction. Are we going to fight? Are we going to run or just will we suffer? <clears throat> and I, this is one of those kind of fascinating moments because most people today, when I talk to Christians, are assuming if there ever was a war again in our country, we would be the kind of people that if war ever came to my county or my city, that I would be the kind of person who would fight to protect my city. And so I find it fascinating that in the restoration movement during the Civil War, the most hardcore pacifists during the entire course of the war are the people that are living in the areas that are most hardest hit by the war. So we're going to see that many of the people living in Virginia, Georgia, and Tennessee in particular are going to be the most outspoken adherents for pacifism. One such example is from Benjamin Franklin writing in Tennessee. He's going to say this, quote, we will not take up arms against and fight and kill the brethren which we have labored for 20 long years to bring into the kingdom of God, unquote. Now, that's in a personal letter that Franklin was writing to J.W. McGarvey. And I find it fascinating that his biggest reason for saying we won't take up arms, we won't fight and kill, is simply because, look, we've spent the last 20 years starting this Christian movement, and I'm not about to waste my time and effort to just turn around and do the opposite of what I've been trying to do. And this is going to be one of the, in my opinion, strongest arguments for Christian pacifism, that if you are sold out to the idea that a human being 
is worthy of being saved by the gospel. Nothing contradicts that truth stronger than saying, and if you are a part of an evil nation, if you are a part of an aggressive nation, if you are a part of a group that we are going to war with, tough luck, I will kill you instead of give you the gospel. Personally, I find this to be a contradiction as distant as East is from the West. Now, what we're also going to find is that as the war continues, it's going to go from 1861 all the way to 1864, that we're going to start to see more and more leaders, both from the first generation and then from an emerging second generation of the Restoration Movement, who are going to publish personal statements that either say that they denounce the war or that their congregation denounces the war. And it's going to be, you know, both particular and general. Many of these people are going to come out and say very forcefully, the civil war that we are currently fighting is wrong. But they will also go so far as to say, and just Christian involvement in war in general is wrong. And so, you know, we've looked at many of these names already, but just look at the luminaries on this list. We've got Alexander Campbell, we've got David Lipscomb, we've got Barton W. Stone, we've got Benjamin Franklin, we've got Tobit Fanning, we've got Moses Lard, we've got J.W. McGarvey. Pretty much anyone who is anyone in the Restoration Movement has come to a conclusion that war is a bad thing for this movement. And... I would like to point out the ideas of a young man by the name of J.W. McGarvey on these lines where he says this, quote, Whether I become a citizen of this union or become a citizen of the Southern Confederacy, my feelings towards my brethren everywhere shall know no change. And this is an idea we'll talk about a little later in the lecture, but let me just plant the seeds for it now. McGarvey's comment here indicates that his citizenship is not dependent on whether he is Southern or Northern. His citizenship is that he is a person who dwells in the kingdom of God, and he just so happens to be living in what we would call the United States of America. And so he basically says, you know, it doesn't really matter which country the land I live on becomes. What's important where my identity comes from is that I am in Christ and other people that are in Christ are my countrymen. Now, you know what they say in the physical sciences. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And just as we see many people in the Restoration Movement becoming pacifists, we also see many people in the Restoration Movement during this time are going to become very galvanized towards supporting the war. And I would like to point out that it's largely people from the North that will be most likely to support the Union war efforts, and that they will do so both with their words and their finances, as well as with their active participation. Now, in both cases, both talking the North and the South, the belligerents involved will be certain that God is on their side. Many Restoration Movement soldiers who were living in the North, who enlisted with Northern companies, are going to write in their journals, they are going to publish in their magazines, they're going to basically say, the reason we're fighting is because we are punishing a rebellion. Romans 13 verses 1 through 4 says that a government has the right to punish evildoers. And what could be more evil than a group of people within the country arming themselves and trying to start a new government? Basically, Romans 13 says that any kind of unlawful overthrow of the government should be illegal, at least from a Christian standpoint. And they're basically saying anyone in the South who is involved with this, well, simply put, they are they cannot be considered Christians from that point on. And so one of the ways many of these northern uh, pro-war sympathizers are going to justify this belief is they're going to simply say, well, if these people would be rebelling in the first place, we can't really consider them Christians. Now, likewise, Restoration Movement soldiers who joined with the Southern military are going to say, look, we started a new country. There's nothing in the Constitution that says we can't leave. There's nothing in the Constitution that says that we couldn't just start a new country. We did. We started a new country, and we tried to do so peacefully. It's the northern people who are now invading our new country, 
And they basically said, we're fighting a defensive war. And using Augustine's logic, they're going to say, you know, if we are fighting a defensive war, it makes us in the right and it makes the northern people in the aggressive stance the wrong. And they're going to say, if they're in the wrong, we can't consider them Christian. And so I do find it interesting that on both sides of the argument, we are going to see a strong tendency from both the northern and southern parties to first basically have to say, I can't consider you a brother or sister in Christ anymore. That your country has overstepped the line, and because you are siding with your country, I can't consider you a Christian from this point on. And so this is going to be one of the biggest challenges we see facing the Restoration Movement. People like McGarvey who are going to say, look, identity is in Christ, even above and beyond government, are going to run into real problems when they find people that say, my identity is in Christ and my government. And so we're going to start to see a very interesting set of problems that this will not be an evenly distributed uh, set of set of propositions. We are going to find people in the South who are pacifists. We're going to find people in the North who are pacifists. We're going to find people in the South who are pro-war. We're going to find people in the North who are pro-war. And to make it complicated, they're all going to use the Bible to justify their position. So now, because this is a lot to kind of take in all at one time, let me just kind of summarize some of these issues here real quick before we continue. So why was pacifism so important? Well, the first issue is going to be evangelism. The Restoration Movement is going to say it's just a paradox to say we want to save human souls by the Word of God, and then also to say we will take up arms and kill other human beings if my government tells me to do so. They're basically going to say, if I had to have the choice between telling you the gospel and shooting you, I will tell you the gospel. And so many of the pacifists are going to see evangelism as being the primary reason to not be involved in war. A second reason, and this goes back all the way to Thomas Campbell, is that many within the Restoration Movement are going to say, you know, the whole reason we started this movement is because we don't trust church-state relationships. And we're going to find some, like Tolbert Fanning, who are going to basically say, no, if you're going to join this restoration movement, you should have absolutely nothing to do with anything within the government, even including voting. Because, as Fanning would argue, you know, the burger schism in the Presbyterian Church started because of a political issue. If Christians get involved in politics, they will eventually divide on political issues and not doctrine. And this is going to be one of the strong facets of many Southern churches, even to this day, is that if you are going to be focusing on politics, you're not focusing on Christ and his church. Now, to this, I'd like to add a observation that while it isn't universal. There is this idea that many of the people who are going to support pacifism are just a little bit past their prime. People like Campbell and Stone are well into their 50s and, you know, you know what they say, war is a young man's sport. And I would it would be very interesting had things been different if Campbell was a young man in his 20s or early 30s if he would have felt differently about the war had he had a body that would have let him go or not. And so what we're going to find is that some of the more outspoken people against the war are also going to be some of the older, kind of more venerable people within the movement. And then lastly is this issue of citizenship. Many within the Restoration Movement are going to say that in becoming a Christian, I actually renounce my citizenship to any other country. And we're going to see this in people like David Lipscomb, Tolbert Fanning, that not only are they going to say Christians should not be involved in the government, they're going to explicitly say, my citizenship is in Christ's kingdom. I have no other citizenship. I have no other loyalties. And this is going to make many people conclude that had things like the Pledge of Allegiance existed during David Lipscomb's day, that he probably would have said, you know what, I can't say this, I'm a Christian. And we'll let 
some of Lipscomb's own words describe this further. This comes from his book on civil government, where he says this, quote, Christ's mission, i.e. the mission of his kingdom, is to put down and destroy all these other kingdoms and to destroy everything that exercises rule, authority, or power on earth. How can the servants of Christ be subjects of his kingdom, enter into, strengthen, and build up that which is the kingdom and uh, that which, which Christ and his kingdom are commissioned to destroy? Unquote. If I could summarize that, Lipscomb basically says, you know, one of these days Christ is coming back and he's not going to establish a democracy. He's not going to ask, you know, all these other kingdoms, so do you want to become a member of my kingdom? He's basically going to say, all you Christians come into my kingdom, everyone else go to hell. And Lipscomb is going to say, it is unchristian to spend time building up Christ's kingdom and to build up other kingdoms of this world as well. Now, while I don't necessarily agree with taking things this far, I do think that he has a point of, if I am ever faced with the question of, do I serve Christ or do I serve man, that that would seem to be a no-brainer. I would hopefully serve Christ. But notice what's happened here, that Lipscomb and many people of this pacifist persuasion basically say, my identity as a Christian trumps all other identities. And if you ask me to join any other kingdom, I won't. And then lastly, we have the issue just straightforward of geography, that most of the Civil War took place on Southern soil. And the question of pacifism is going to come up again and again in places where they're actively fighting battles. And so, people who are facing violence on a day-to-day -day basis, who are losing friends and family due to either fighting in the war or just because they were in the wrong place in the wrong time when a cannon shot through their farm, you know, we are going to see that these people are going to strongly ask the question, what is my job? What is my role in this problem? And many of them are going to make the choice that as a Christian, I can either be violent or I can be defensive and run. Or third, I can take it and suffer. And interestingly, many of those who choose to be pacifists will choose to take it and suffer. Whereas in the North, we're just not going to find as many pacifists. And I think part of the reason for that is that in the North, as this map has shown, we just simply don't see many battles happening above in Northern Territory. And so many people in the North were able to contemplate the problem of war in a very abstract way. It's one thing to say, I will be a pacifist when someone, you know, tomorrow could come in and shoot me. It's another thing to say, I will be a pacifist or I, I will support a war when, quite frankly, I may never be asked to make the choice, at least in a way that is real and binding. And so I find this just to be an interesting state of affairs, that the geography, most of the people who are pacifist are also going to come from areas that are most war-torn. And so, with all of that in mind, let's try to wrap this up, and we'll discuss some of these issues in our next lecture, lecture as well. But let me just say from the get-go that the Civil War is going to leave a very deep scar in the Restoration Movement. In fact, the scar is going to be so deep that it will eventually, in my opinion, tear the movement apart. It won't do so like it did for so many other denominations where there will be a break leading up to or during the Civil War, but it will leave kind of a gaping and festering wound that will just kind of grow worse and worse until the movement will break. And I think the biggest thing that we'll see here after the Civil War, we're going to start to see people referring to themselves as Northern or Southern members within the Restoration Movement, that they will start to have identity of being North or South. And so anytime we have a new controversy that's going to arise, whether it be the Missionary Society, which we'll spend most of our next lecture looking at, or the questions of musical instruments or the growth of the liberal scholarship, which we'll look at next week, on both sides of the argument, we're often going to see that there are North-South divisions, that the people from the North, 
are going to tend to be lining up on one side, while people on the south are going to tend to line up on the other. And they are going to just have a natural distrust of one another from this moment forward. And, you know, we see this even to this day, that the more liberal branch of the Restoration Movement, known as the Disciples of Christ, has many more churches and is much stronger in the North, whereas the conservative branches, the non-instrumental Churches of Christ and the Christian Churches, Churches of Christ, tend to be much more active and successful in the South. And so what we are seeing is that the Civil War created a scar that allowed for this movement to begin to identify along partisan party lines. And once this happens, the Restoration Movement will in many ways have reached its peak and will start to have to deal with real issues of decline from this moment on. Now, just to make things a little bit more interesting, I should also note that after the Civil War, most of the Christians on all sides of the Restoration Movement are going to begin to advocate for military and governmental involvement. Simply put, the idea of pacifism after this point of the Civil War is going to die out. And many people note that there's a tie between pacifism and many of the post-millennial ideas of Alexander Campbell and the early first generation Restoration Movement leaders. And so it brings up a very interesting question. Was pacifism so grounded in post-millennialism that once we started to become pessimistic of post-millennialism, where we started to basically say, you know, this world really isn't getting better. Things like the Civil War just prove human beings are evil and need to be reined in by governments. Once this kind of movement is made, post-millennialism will begin to fade, and the idea of pacifism will begin to fade with it. And so that is an interesting thing you will probably want to think about. Is pacifism, as a doctrine of Christianity, linked to a millennial idea? And if so, what happens if that millennial idea falls out of favor? And as we've looked at in other lectures, I'll conclude with this. So far in this week, we've covered slavery and pacifism, and we've noted that in both cases, the Bible alone can paint a very complex picture of these ideas, that a person could make a pro-slavery argument just as easily as they can make a anti-slavery argument using scripture. And the same could be said for pacifism. And so we once again have to raise the hermeneutical problem. If the scriptures seem to point in multiple directions, who has the authority to arbitrate and interpret these problems? And this is going to bring us to where we're going to talk about in our third lecture for the week. As the Restoration Movement begins to realize it needs to organize, these questions of, does that organization carry with it authority? or the ability to say to multiple churches, I am now imposing a new authority over all of you, will become a paramount issue. So, thank you for your time. God bless you, my friends, and we'll see you again later on this week.